This episode of The Edge is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek.fm at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trek.fm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. You're listening to Trek FM. What have you done out there on the edge of Federation space? Hi, everyone. We're live. Woo! We're here live from the edge. Woohoo! Everyone, woohoo! Raise your hands. Yay! We're doing this. <laughs> well, I tell you, I'm ready. I got zero preparation, plenty of hot takes, and lots of rage. So let's go. <laughs> That's uh, what we ask from all of our guests. <laughs> yes. Are we ready Hi, for everyone. some Welcome. DEFCON level fun? DEFCON level fun here on Live okay, from Poppy. the Edge. Poppy. I'm so ready, Poppy. Don't you love that name? I uh, do. So everyone, hi, welcome. I'm Bruce Gibson. Welcome to the show. And with me, as she always is, is Brandy Jacola. How are you doing, Brandy? I, you had some technical issues there. Oh, there were so many technical issues that we've never had before. And now they're fixed. And now I know what to do in the future. So yay. Yes. And those who are joining us live or listening later, we started 15 minutes late because all kinds of issues going on, but it's all fixed. All the technical issues we've gotten the... uh Control under control, I guess you can say. <laughs> we and got the gremlins out of the works, man. We did. Speaking of gremlins, we have a guest with us on the show tonight. <laughs> I'm a gremlin? Well, keep me out of bright light, yeah. then. <laughs> bright, 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 bright. We have John Krikorian here. How are you doing? Hey, Bruce. Hey, Brandy. It is great to be here with you. Um, I am super excited. And as I said earlier, I'm ready for some DEF CON level fun talking about the Red Angel. It's going to be awesome. It is going to be awesome. Before we start, John, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I've been a Star Trek fan since I was six years old, watching it on reruns cross-legged in front of the TV uh, as a Ute growing up in New York and uh, have loved it ever since. There's never a time I wasn't into Star Trek. And uh, just about a year ago, I decided to get into the Star Trek podcasting world. So I started a podcast called Trek Profiles over on Tricorder Transmissions, where I interview Star Trek fans about why they love Star Trek and why it matters to them. And uh, it's been a super awesome experience. I just passed my one year mark, and it's added so much to my fandom that I've just decided that I love doing this podcasting thing and talking to other folks about Trek. There's just nothing that uh, nothing that beats it. Absolutely. Yes, it's a great show. I've enjoyed listening to it. And we're so glad to have you in here. And I'm so glad that the chat group is here active as always for the last 15 plus minutes. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we might as well get right into it. So yeah, we're talking about the Red Angel. This is episode 10 of season two. And uh, I don't know, first impressions of after watching it, does it live up to the hype, do you think? Because, you know, we've been trying to figure out who the Red Angel is. And, of course, we're going into spoilers right away. Because if you're listening to this, I hope you watch the episode because you're going to be spoiled. But, you know, we did find out who the Red Angel is at the beginning of the show, kind of. Which I thought was great. Uh, because, you know, normally you're expecting some big giant reveal after a whole bunch of drama. And, you know, at the last minute, someone takes off the helmet and we expect to see who it is. And instead, they're like, oh, by the way, we solved the thing and here's who it is. But, uh, you know, I will say the thing about the episode I think I like the most is that it started with by taking a breath, uh, which is something yes. I think Discovery has not been so good at. And it was nice to see a, a, a more contemplative moment because the show has a tendency to whipsaw around so fast and you know everything is a all this plot at warp seven so it was just nice to have it just start in a place where they could sit and talk to each other and just actually have a moment to remember area i thought it was a nice change of pace honestly i loved it 
Yeah, I, I, I think this, this episode really did take a breath. And it's, I think it's also called, called spending your budget. And so you have to do more ship in the bottle type stuff and <laughs> just people talking. But that's a good thing. That's a really good thing because I enjoyed that. Brandy, what did you think? Well, I um, was immediately crying. I so know. thanks again, Discovery. That's 10 for 10 this season. You've made me cry every episode for various reasons. And, of course, I cried multiple times in this episode. But we'll get to that. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, loved, I loved hearing the other members of the crew talking about Arium. And it was just breaking my heart so much. But it was just really lovely. It was, it was a really lovely thing. I think that's so important, in my opinion, that what you just said, because I've heard some criticism even here on the Trek FM network from some other hosts on the edge. I don't know, but that they just didn't connect to Arium. So the death just didn't really mean anything, didn't feel anything. And my, the way I felt about Arium's death in the previous episode and then the funeral in this episode is to me, it's not so much about Arium but it's about the other characters. I'm relating to our characters and how they're going through a loss and seeing someone that they've loved as part of their crew and reflecting not just on their love for her, but what it is that they're going through in life. And they're reflecting on that. I mean, you saw in the funeral that even when Stamets is making his speech, the camera's going back and forth between Colbert and him. He's really kind of talking about himself, about, yeah. you know, relationships. And I think that's the important thing to, to take from Arium's death. Yeah, the only thing I'd, I'd say, and I don't want to re rehash last week, but the, the one contribution I'll, I'll make to it is that the thing that sets Discovery apart as an episode of Star Trek, or as a series of Star Trek, I should say, is that we're having this continuous show that's a streamable show. So if you're a streamable show... Um, they're writing season long arcs. So they're breaking down the whole season. They're not like getting spec scripts, you know, thrown through the door, like in the, you know, in the eighties with TNG and stuff. So they had all the tools to, to put that Arium moments in the show earlier. Cause they don't have like the running time constraints that you have on network TV. You know, they, they had all the tools there and they just didn't use them. And it, and it felt a little bit like a wasted opportunity, but I will agree with you that, that if they were going to do it all in one show, they did the best they possibly could. Right. And so yes. I, I thought it was great, but there was, in my opinion, a missed opportunity there to, cause imagine how cool it would have been with the same episode we just got. And then we had seen, who was it, uh, Stamets, who was talking about the randomness of the universe that Arium talked about? You know, if we had just seen like a line of that conversation like five episodes ago, how much better that would have been, you know? So yeah. that, that's the only thing I'll say about it. But I thought it was all yeah, pretty I well agree. done. I agree with you there. Of course, it would have had a greater impact had we known that character a little better. Um, and yeah, they did have the opportunities to do that. I was thinking today, just imagine if that character was Tilly. Well, you know. Oh, I honestly. With, considering that Tilly is my favorite, I cried just as much for Arium as I would have for Tilly. I was sobbing, guys. But sobbing. you don't know her as well, so why is that? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me how well I know the character. It was They showed me enough of her for me to connect to her humanity, which is what we haven't seen up to this point. Yes, I know. They could have done this. They could have done that. That's not what they did. This is what we have. And it affected me on a deep, deep level. Now, maybe that's because that's just the way I'm built. But I don't see how anyone couldn't be affected by that. But that's just me. No, I think that's great. That's fair. <sighs> I'm just really emotional, yo. You are. It's okay. I, I lo it's funny because I, I was, as I was watching the episode, rewatching it actually to get to get ready for this. One of the things that occurred to me is I think we've actually had more lines from Commander Non in like two episodes than Arium got in all of season one. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> really. I would have to go back and count, but I'm not going to right now. I'm doing this right now. No, I know. Yes. I, I guess I, I don't expect to bring out the tally sheets just yet, but. <laughs> well, I, I, I felt like I've had a little more Arium than a lot of other people because I've read some of the comics and Arium has had some role in the comics. So that but isn't it, isn't it helps. mirror Arium or it am has, I wrong? Yeah, it was mostly mirror okay. Arium. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I looked at some of the comics. I'm not up to 
the latest, but I read a few of them and I seem to recall it was a lot of mirror universe stuff. Yeah. I wonder if Saru sings in the mirror universe like he does in this one. Uh, probably not because he's dead. <laughs> is my I guess. Mean now, but when he was alive. <laughs> he's roasted on a spit somewhere. And by the way, someone has said this in the chat. Yes, it was Doug Jones singing. He has been a singer for most of his life. He used to be a soloist in his church. So, yes, that was absolutely him mm-hmm. singing. Really? And he was terrified to do it because it was in Kelpian. <laughs> so, and he had never actually sung in Kelpian. So, but it, it turned out beautifully and made me cry even harder. So, well done, Doug. See, well I done. thought at first it was him singing, and then later I thought, oh, no, that can't be him, because I thought he was awful in the carpool karaoke stuff. His yeah, well, voice. that's a different thing. <laughs> carpool karaoke does not always showcase someone's Kelpian. best vocal talents. Oh. So, but no, I've heard him sing other than this, and he he is very good when he's not just, you know, when he's he's had a lot more time to rehearse, let's just say it that way. Because that's the whole thing about karaoke is it's not big on rehearsal. Mm. Hey, you want to know something cool I picked up from the episode, though, as I was watching it that kind of made me squee a little bit? Was that we uh, we learned that that Detmer is augmented, and I I originally took that to be an assistive device, like she was injured in some way, like on the Shenzhou, and uh, you know that was just like Jordy's visor kind of thing, except it was you know just on half of her head. But when she was talking about Arium at the funeral, and she was talking about not being afraid of her augment, I thought, wow, it's not like okay, I'm gonna get you you know some amount of vision back, but it was like a you know, a a whole step up, you know, and I just thought that was great. I I was glad to find out that little tidbit. So I thought that was cool. I always actually assumed it was some kind of augment because of just the way it was attached to her head. And I just thought there's, there's got to be something in her brain that is actually interfacing with that so that she has vision in that eye. So it never occurred to me that it wasn't an augment of some kind. Maybe I, she never we, really we never really got it. an explanation, right? We we a lot of the background crew is sort of you know just there, and we don't get those explanations, you know. So it was just nice to get an answer one way or the other. So I appreciated it. Yeah, no, that was that is interesting. Like I'd like to hear a little more about that, of course, you know, and learn more about these other characters on the bridge. Um, yeah, I just always figured, yes, she had an accident when she was on the Shinju, and then she has this thing that just kind of helps her eye, but there might be a little more to that than what meets the eye. <laughs> Sorry. So, oh, God, how that hurt me. I, I've got a pain right here, right here now that you said that. Ow. Ow. It, it couldn't have been done any other way. Let's <laughs> So I've got a question. Why is Spock yes. not back in uniform? Because he doesn't feel like it. I, well, that's an interesting question because I watched it a second time today and I thought, why is he still wearing the beard? And it's the same thing. I guess he's just uh, on, I, still on leave. <laughs> still on I vacation. Think he's techni- yeah, I'm pretty sure he's technically still on leave. Second of all, he has not. He doesn't is, like the discovered uniforms. No, No. (laughs) I don't think it has anything to do with that either. I think it has everything to do with the fact that he is not actually acting as a Starfleet officer at this time. And he, I don't think he wants to be acting as a Starfleet officer at this time because he went through something extremely traumatic where he almost lost his mind. And he doesn't want the added burden of being an officer right now as well. It, he needs to get back to a place where he can balance his logic and emotions Mm -hmm. and he isn't in that place yet. Yeah. The chat says he's still on medical leave and Spock is still wearing the beard because Burnham doesn't like it. Oh, it's a little bit of sibling. I love it. (laughs) It's a little bit of sibling uh, tweaking going on there. (laughs) Oh, he does a lot of that in this episode. Yeah. How'd you think of that? I love some of those scenes between them (laughs) and there's times he's just needling her and other times he's very supportive and apologizing to her. Or accepting her apology, I should say. Yeah. No, they, well, and that's the... Th- I'm sorry, go no, ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I think they've got the, the whole sibling sort of, you know, needling each other thing down in a very sort of Vulcan human synthetic way, you know? And I thought it was just great. I thought it was acted well. I thought it was written well. Um, you know, and you can give or take, you know, w- you can leave or take whether you're, you're like Burnham or not and the whole scenario. But uh, the scenes between them, I just thought were stellar. 
stellar in space. I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'll be and here honestly, week. guys, it couldn't have been done any other way. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I agree, though. I love every interaction between Spock and Burnham or Spock and anybody. Or burn them in anybody. I mean, just, <laughs> I'm easy to please. But when they're together, when it comes to those two. <sighs> yeah, I was like, ooh, exactly. So, I, but I just really love that because you know I have two sisters, and you know we uh, rib each other good naturedly when we were kids. It was maybe not so good natured sometimes, but uh, yeah, it's like yeah, that's something I would have probably done to one of my sisters <laughs> at some time. So just needle. Oh yeah. But my favorite one was when my favorite thing I think about it, besides them finally f- coming to some kind of unspoken agreement and tenuous being able to be in the same room without biting at each other. But when he's talking about how she's got this complex about, say, you know, trying to take control of situations for which she has no responsibility. I don't remember the exact uh, word. Take responsibility just, for situations for sh- outside of her control. Yeah, and thanks for sharing. <laughs> thanks for sharing that. Yeah, with everyone. Spock, appreciate it. Thanks for sharing that with the room. Yeah, yeah I like that one so much I'd written it down. I thought it was just fantastic. Yeah. And then he says something else, and she's just like, like, you're on a roll, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yep. We will speak of this later, you and I. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. But you know which conversation really irked me, I, I have to say, was uh, Leland and Burnham, uh, their little uh, tete-a-tete in the, uh, in, in the little lab there, because Leland is supposed to be this top Section 31 guy, and he seems to me to be the stupidest person who's ever walked the face of any planet anywhere. I mean, the guy seems to be just a bumbling idiot. Uh, he didn't expect her to hit him. Uh, that seems surprising. Oh, oh, she's angry with me. Huh? I wonder why that might be. You know? Uh, oh, he he can't see that that Giorgio, uh, literally space Hitler Giorgio, is manipulating him. Uh, I I'm just amazed that the guy got anywhere in life, much less to be in charge of section some sort of section thirty one ship. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm not so impressed with Leland. I really not. But I in his defense in that scene, I would think that maybe his guard is down because he's revealing all this information of killing her parents and he's just not, you know, focused and on top of things like he maybe used maybe used to be because I have a feeling he used to be a very good officer and then he got really bad. <laughs> I don't know. How would he have got yeah. to that position? He's he's not very good. So how did he even get that high? I don't know. They they must have Peter principled right in, him right into that job. You know, if you know that old trope, right, is that you get promoted to your minimum level of incompetence, right? So you're you're good at yeah. your job. You're good at your job. You're good at your job. You're not good at your job. That's where you stay, right? And so that's oh, that's true. Yeah, I know a lot of people who aren't good at their jobs and they've got to the top. Yep. So that that must be it. It must be the Peter principle. I, I can think of no other explanation because the guy has been so singularly unimpressive. Uh, I love the actor, by the way. That's not a criticism of the actor, but the the character right. is so tremendously idiotic. I, I just I find it hard to get my brain wrapped around how he got to where he is. Yeah, I I agree. And here's the thing: I don't think that it was about Leland not expecting the punch coming. I think it was more about he didn't expect her to hit that hard. <laughs> Oh, so he, you're thinking, he's like, she's probably going to hit me, but I can take it. Yeah, she's a little tiny thing. I can take, oh, she broke my nose. She broke my nose, guys. <laughs> broke my nose. <laughs> yeah, never underestimate the power of an angry woman, no matter her size. True that. <laughs> so true, so true. So, yeah, my, that, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say it was very satisfying <laughs> to watch her pummel. As Spock said, right? Very satisfying. Although I, mm-hmm. I, I think my favorite moment of Leland incompetence was designing jabby, stabby eye needles into the ocular devices on his ship. I, for one, enjoy stabby eye needles in all of my eye equipment. Makes a trip to the optometrist like a game of, uh, you know, chicken. It's great. So much fun. Well, here is my thought on that. Maybe the needles weren't supposed to be there because we've already seen that control can manufacture holograms. Maybe it can manufacture its own hardware now as well. Jabby stabby needles in all the eye gear. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Just like, oh, what's an easy way to kill this guy or seriously maim him? Hmm. I need his voice, but I don't need him. So stabby eyes. Yes. I mean, that would be the. If, 
easiest way. If, if the AI wanted to kill him, I mean, that seems to me to be a very easy thing for the AI to arrange. <laughs> Right. I mean, space is, you know, not a hospitable place. Right. And, you know, it's all the systems are there to try to keep you alive. You know, one of those things goes sideways and, you know, that's the end of you. So I don't know. I think I don't think we have all the data yet. I don't think we know exactly no. what, what's going on. But yeah, I don't no, know why don't there, so. there. I don't know why there would be needles in that thing either. That is kind of interesting. I don't even know what he was doing. He was <laughs> doing. He, he was unlocking. He was taking the security restrictions off so that they could use more power to close the wormhole. Okay. I knew he was turning off. The, I knew he was saying, you know, uh, doing a security buffer override, but I wasn't really clear as to why he was doing that. Because they needed more power and the ship wouldn't, the computer wouldn't let them do it. It was too dangerous is what I'm assuming. Okay. It, so they had to have security overrides. And so that's what he went to do. Okay. And, and the interesting thing is that, Apparently, Control wants the Red Angel marooned here because it allowed him, it gave it the power, gave them the power to close the wormhole. So yep. that was, in its mind, for its benefit. You know, this so, is... Uh, oh, go ahead, Bruce. I was just going to say, Control seems so out of control. <laughs> like, you can't even guess what it wants to do or what it doesn't want to do. I don't, I don't, again, don't have enough information, like John says. I don't have all, I don't have enough why why don't you have the information you're on a show you're on a podcast you should know everything it's all hot takes and rage brandy come on because <laughs> <laughs> i don't know I... jack sh- something something <laughs> 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 something jack we almost had a word <laughs> Oh, we had words before we had uh, got on well, live. There was most of them out of my mouth. All right, the, the, <laughs> the, the chat is calling me out saying Leland is not as bad as we think. All right, so he, if he's got some master plan and he's playing seven D chess, I'm. I, you know what? I'm not smart enough to watch Star Trek Discovery then because I, I literally cannot figure it out. But um, the the one thing I will say is, I, and I've said this in other contexts, which is I. And this is not a criticism of any of the podcasting that we're doing, but it, it always feels like to me that y- you can't even really look at an episode of Discovery. It's like saying, well, I read chapter seven of Lord of the Rings and let's evaluate it. It's it's a it's a you got to kind of look at the thing as a burrito and not pull out the rice and eat the rice and be like, well, that rice was not good, you know, and then eat the beans. You know, it, it's a whole meal. And I think that um, I think that the show really has to finish a season to be looked at as a whole. And I, I almost feel like it's a little bit of a fool's game. It's fun, but it's, a, it's, it's almost a little bit of a fool's errand to try to analyze these episodes like we could with the more classic Trek, but you know, I'm game for it. It's still, still a pleasant thing to talk about. Yeah. Well, it's like, I was watching it with my wife and I mean, I know we're, we're open to spoilers. I don't really, really want to jump to the end, but she was just asking me like, Oh, well, how can this be? And I'm like, well, I don't know. We'll have to see what happens in the next episode. You're right. It's not going to be all resolved in one episode. We have to get through every chapter to get to the end of the book and say, okay, how did that story play out? And then at that point, if you don't have answers, you either say, okay, they missed this. They never answered it. That's confusing. I don't like it. Or, well, maybe we'll see that in season three. I see Christopher. Or maybe, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Or, or maybe we'll no, see it in the Section 31 spinoff. <laughs> you know, it could be there. Why am I seeing things in the t- chat about Tasha's, Tasha's sister? <laughs> anyway, go on. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just want to give a shout out to Christopher Littlefield, who came up with Star Trek Burrito. You, sir, are very interesting, yes. and your ideas are interesting, and I wish to subscribe to your newsletter. That's all I want to say. <laughs> Well, you can go back to last week's Live from the Edge and see his opinions on that episode of Star Trek Discovery. I wonder what the M5 computer thinks of this, though. I don't know. Uh, uh, talk about plenty of hot takes and lots of rage. That's the M5 right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. My favorite All right. scene, though. From this week, yes. my favorite little bit, just and it was Please. such a nice little scene, was just the non-Burnham scene in the hallway. I just want to give a shout out. I thought both the actors did tremendous. Um, I thought it was just really well acted, beautifully shot, beautifully done. I have no notes. <laughs> That's cool. Well, good. I did, That good. scene, I mean, it didn't stand out to me. That's interesting. I mean, I thought it was good, but it just, if anything stood out to me, it was more Burnham's reaction to finding out that she wasn't responsible for her parents' death. 
I mean, that performance of just, you know, the tears and the different emotions and just taking the time and just playing that and then just, you know, the anger and before the punch. I mean, she sold me right there as a performance. That was awesome. So I do see that uh, uh, Lindsay Latham says Leland should not be blamed for Michael's parents because it was an accident. How is him not warning them about Klingons coming for that time, Crystal, an accident? That is not an accident. That is negligence. When, that doesn't yes. make it an accident. When you, when you are in a uh, you know intelligence sort of counterintelligence type role like Section 31, your whole job is to think about every possibility, right? Exactly. That's a fail. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we mm-hmm. already established Leland's stupid. So. <laughs> yeah, he knew. <laughs> he knew. He knew that the t- that the Klingons had tracked the time crystal. He knew that. Right. He he didn't do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm sort of getting apprehensive a little bit about this Section 31 show, mostly because I'm I'm a little wrapped around the axle about Giorgio. And and I tweeted something about this, but I mean, I love Michelle Yeoh. I, I love everything about the actress, but the character is horrendous, right? I mean, she is literally evil and has killed millions of people. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I, I don't know. Are we, we're supposed to be rooting for her? Uh, I'm not really digging that right now. I'm not feeling it. Don't you, don't you feel like they're softening her, though? Yes, I do. Because that last interaction between her and Michael, and there didn't even need to be words. It's just Michael starts to walk away, and she grabs her shoulder. And and Michael puts her hand over Georgiou's, and they just have this exchange of expressions, and it says more than words ever could. And I'm just like, okay, that was beautiful. Because it shows that she does have feelings. She does have emotions and connections of a positive nature. And despite the fact that this is not her Michael, that this is the Michael that wants to save the universe. She still, she still doesn't want her to die. She still thinks she still wants to help her. I I get that. So that can't be all bad. Yeah. But you know, it's like in this episode, I felt that Giorgio was more captain Giorgio. Like this is the point where I was like, she feels more like our prime universe one and not the mirror universe one. And Uh, I'm just wondering why. (laughs) Oh, really? That whole scene with Stamets and Culber and Tilly. (laughs) Oh, not that scene. (laughs) I'm talking about the scenes with Burnham and how she's, you know, reacting. But even when she's looking at, at Culber and Stamets, when they're down the planet, and Cobra comes to Stamets and wants to talk to him. He says, not now. I almost felt like she's looking at him like she's kind of watching out for them and, and trying to make it work in her own way. Helping them. Yeah, I, I kind of felt that as well. And I, <laughs> I really do appreciate Michelle's, Michelle Yeoh's performance as well. Because it is full of, yeah, she, she has a great time. Chew in the scenery when it's called for, but she also has these great quiet moments like she did yeah. with Michael, like she did when she was looking at Stamets and Culber down on the planet. But is that and really true to the character? I think so. I think, honestly, we don't know her well enough to say that she's irredeemable. I don't think she's irredeemable. But should she be? I mean, if she killed millions or thousands or whatever it is, I don't know. I mean, we know she's conducted genocides, right? And done so, I would say, gleefully. And so when you put the fact that, you know, here's someone who is probably the the very worst kinds of things that people say about people they hate, you know, in today's pop culture, you know, racist, you know, uh, uh, evil person who hates the other, you know, all the kind of thing, like the worst possible things. She's all of that. All of it and did it, you know, but in by direct order or in her name, planets were exterminated. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how I can rehabilitate that. So that's my own struggle. And, you know, I'm, I'm OK to see where it goes. But I just mark me down as very skeptical. Yeah. I mean, I want to. I like her. And that's what scares me is that I'm liking <laughs> this character. And I was thinking even watching this episode how much I want to see the section 31 series because of her. And then I think in the back of my mind, how, but think of that past that she has, how can I forgive that of her? Even though if she turns into a good section 31 person, or (laughs) I don't know what that is anyway. 
Well, I'm going to say one last thing on the subject, and this is from a guy named David Jacola. Um, I don't know who that is. Some new guy. He know. says, also, you can be a product of your environment. Prime Universe encourages good behavior. I, I, I'd agree yes. with that. But I would also say that I, I do think I'm a believer that there are objective standards of right and wrong. And while there's a big gray yes. area, you know, I, I'm just not sure that, you know, wiping out whole populations is, you know, anywhere on the good side of the ledger. But, yeah, I mean, if Hitler came to Utah and became a Mormon, you're not going to be like, oh, it's OK now. Um, yeah, because I'm not Mormon. <laughs> I know. So what does that have to do with anything? It doesn't. I'm just exactly. Well, s- since, you, <laughs> you know? since you went there, since you went there, Bruce, whatever you might think about Hitler, she's actually worse. Who, Br- uh, Brandy is? No! Oh, God, yeah. no! <laughs> I mean, I like I know. No! I'm kidding, Space I'm Hitler. kidding. No. We got to you found got out Space my Space Hitler, uh, Giorgio, who is, you know, how many people has she killed? She's I mean, worse. it's 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 scary, and, you know, she's gleefully, yeah, gleefully um, eaten, eaten other sentient beings. I mean, blah. Anyway, we digress. <laughs> yeah. She's the but red It's nice devil. to know that Bruce thinks I'd make a good Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> well, I only thought that when you were having the technical issues before we went on the show. <laughs> yeah. You we were, we were getting evil there for a while. I'm going to need to go into yeah. counseling for how I was treated before the show began. I hope the pre-show was not recorded because, you know, it'll, it, it gave me like nightmares. I'm still having a little bit of sweats over this. Oh, my gosh. Oh, John, I forgot you were still here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, we we spent a lot of time on Giorgio, and she's like not a very big player in this episode compared to others, of course. Um, anything else that really stands out that you want to talk about? What do you think about this whole time travel suit thing that was developed by her parents, and they're part of Section Thirty One? Does does that story work for you? Because some of it works for me, and other parts of it doesn't because well i thought this suit was so futuristic and then well it was created 20 years ago just because something seems like it's unattainable technology doesn't mean that it is because how much technology does section 31 have that's way more advanced than anything in starfleet well, that's why I had a criticism in previous ep- the previous episodes, whatever, where they're like, well, it's got to be from the future because the technology is in advance. I'm like, that doesn't mean it's from the future. It could be from another planet that you're not even familiar with that's more technically advanced than you are. Yeah, And here's exactly. somebody who's actually from your planet that did it, not even from your planet. They're your parents. They're mama and papa, and they made it themselves 20 years ago. They knew how to cook up a suit. The, the way I thought about it as just an interesting thought experiment was I was thinking about uh, the traditional Spider-Man story, you know, that Peter Parker is raised by his wonderful aunt and uncle and the death of his his uncle who raised – or is it his grandfather now? I can't remember. It doesn't matter. But but the kindly old man, you know, relative of his who raised him, you know, dies and he feels this responsibility and he decides to become Spider-Man, right? And, and, and do good. And then imagine, you know, you know what? It wouldn't surprise me if there was a comic that actually did this. But, oh, you know, he's not the person you thought he was. He actually invented the radioactive spider that bit you. And, you know, he act- it, it would, like, turn the whole story around, you know? And I kept thinking, do I want that story? Do, do I? And I was like, oh, I don't know if I do. <laughs> this doesn't sound appealing to me. But I'll take the ride and see where it goes. That would be an interesting take. Yeah, I'd like to see that. But that's kind of what happened. Actually, there's yeah, there there's a slight element of that in uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, except not on a, a father or grandfather level, but an uncle level for sure. When you find out your wonderful uh, spoiler, spoiler alert, anyone who hasn't seen Into the Spider-Verse, close your ears right now, okay? But poor Miles finds out that his uncle is working for Kingpin and is the person who's been trying to kill him. How do you think that felt? Didn't feel good, but it was interesting. Doggone right. <laughs> are, are you done? Can I put my I'm done. I'm back? done. <laughs> so d- don't, I didn't hear don't, any of that. Don't listen to the tracks later either, Bruce, or you'll get spoiled. Okay, I won't do that. Hey, so th- here's m- here's my head cannon, and maybe this is kind of hinted at in a way. Anyway, maybe this is the intention, but the suit uh, was being developed because the Klingons were playing with time travel, 
And they were saying also that there had been other planets, including Earth, that had some advanced technology. And the comment was made, you know, it could be from the future. And I think it was even Burnham was like, well, you know, who's to say that they couldn't just have done that themselves? But I also started thinking about the temporal Cold War and if there was some play in that in the past that some people have access or has seen future technologies in order to build these things like the suit. Her, her parents may have access to things that from the future that we're not aware of. Exactly. And that's how I looked at it as well. So, But time yeah. crystals? What the heck? I don't like that part, really. Yeah, but didn't Harry Mudd have one yeah, and, and magic like to make that. the sanest man go mad? I didn't care for that either. So it's not it's not like they just pulled it out of their behinds. It's something that has been shown before. I, I would buy it if it if we find out it's the orb of time from the Bajorans. On the one okay. I, I literally just hate the name Time Crystal. Yes. It it sounds like, you know, and I was tweeting about this today actually with somebody, is it if if you'd seen that movie Avatar, right? The James Cameron film, and they have this element called unobtainium, it is literally like they used a temporary filler word and they just forgot to fix it you know well we'll have the magic time crystal and blah 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 and like no one thought to oh shouldn't we come up with a name for it and they just like ended up in the script and no one ever fixed it you know because time crystal sounds so lame uh it does but i'll buy the story just give me you know chromium you know chromium diasmatic spheres or you know uh mineralized uh uh chronotron uh, elemental uh, substrates or something i don't know I, I I'm so I, I demand very little, but the little I demand, I will have. That's a quote okay, from well, Apollo Justin Ozer, POS, by the way. Justin Ozer just put a link to Wikipedia about time crystals. And I don't care if unobtainium is a real word. It's just it it's one of these things like when you do the real thing in fiction, if it takes you out of the show, it's not good. Oh, believe me, he's not defending it. He's just stating a fact. No, I, I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, we're know? not going to... Huh? Brady, how do you know what that man's thinking in the chat? You don't I don't that. know. I just feel like I have some kind of mental connection to him that I can't explain. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, so the suit and all that stuff. Let me ask you this, because we briefly mentioned that we find out that... Michael is the Red Angel, and that is that near the beginning of the episode. So did you think Michael was going to be the Red Angel and this confirmed your theories? I did, because and here's the thing, okay? You guys know I'm good at figuring things out. And by guys I mean collectively, the yes. people in the chat too. And I usually figure things out. It, sometimes it may be five minutes before it's confirmed, but I usually can put the pieces together. But this blindsided me. And all I can say is, well done, writers at Star Trek Discovery. You pulled one over on me, and that is not easy to do. So, in this, this case, though, as I was thinking about it earlier, it is still possible that Michael can be the Red Angel as yes. well. I just told my wife that, too, and she looked at me cross-eyed. Well, she yeah. does that all the time, but yes, it could be. Well, let's, let's just back up a little. So, yeah, Michael, it's identified that she is the Red Angel, but then we find at the end of the episode, it's really her mom. Yeah, you- and, that, and, that, and that was that thing where I was just like, wait. Wait, that's 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 not Michael. So is that Michael? That's, is that an older Michael? Is that not Michael? And then she yeah. goes, "Mom," and I'm just like, "What the what?" <laughs> Here's my hot take, ladies and gentlemen. You know, towards the end of the season, we're going to see Michael uh, getting into the suit, and she's like, "Yep, I accept that this is my destiny," and that's the end of Michael Berna and SMG, and we're off to season three with uh, some new people. Hot take, really? right off the top of my head. Really? Mm. I see the whole thing like you're saying she gets in the suit, but I don't see her not coming back to the show. <laughs> so so I this is something I've just speculated only because my spider sense has been tingling with some of the stuff they've been doing this season. I think they're yeah. gearing us up to to either kill or get somebody major off the show by the end of the season. And I have a theory on who that is, you know, but I I I, I thought it was going to be another character and and now I think it's going to be Burnham. 
And that's my hot take. I have zero evidence, and I'd stake my life on it. No, I'm kidding. I wouldn't. Wow. But I, I, I see something weird like that. I don't know. Just a prediction. Could totally be wrong, but just a guess. Well, my personal feeling on that is that I hope you're wrong. <laughs> True. Because <laughs> I do not want to see her go. Me either. Especially after this episode. I'm really loving this character as the, we're going along. The, the, the only reason I say this is because the, the show has done, um, you know, when they, when they, before the show even went on the air, they kept talking about how, you know, they were thinking about marquee television, like Game of Thrones and all that stuff, right? And that was in the, in the press. I mean, that was not a secret, right? And the show so far has done two and a half murder take backs on us. So we had Culber who died. He came back. We had Giorgio who died, but then came back. And that's like my half take back. Uh, they were going to, it looked like they wanted to kill Saru for a minute and an Obel for Caron, but then they didn't. So I think they're just kind of teasing us and I think they're going to whack us. Now my, now my thing is like, well, was Arium it or are they, they, is that like the magicians, you know, look at my thing over here. Cause I'm about to punch you in the face. Right. I, I, I don't know. I, I just am very, and this is my meta thinking about how they do TV. I'm just thinking, man, they're going to punch us in the face here in a minute. I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm anxious to see where wow. it goes. Talk about wow. the wild spec, man. I, I, you know, I, I'm way off into tinfoil hat land here. I actually love the idea. I would hate to see the character go, but if that happened, I would be floored. And then the next thing I would stand up and just start clapping and like, bravo, bravo. Good. You know, good having guts to do something like this. <laughs> it, it'd be right up there with nice. the fade, with the cut to black at the end of The Sopranos. I'm telling you, I think it would be. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah and I'll, I'll tell you why they're not going to do that. Female lead, woman of color. They do that. There will be a massive uprising. So I don't think that that's going to happen. So she's protected and can't get hurt in the show. I did not say that she couldn't get hurt. I'm just saying they're not going to kill her I, off. I didn't say she was going to die. I didn't say she was going to die. Yeah, she's off being the I, right I said angel. she gets into the suit and goes off on her mission. That's different. Yeah, I still don't. I still don't see her being gone. By the way, I, don't I came up with all this right now. So <laughs> don't think that there's any deep philosophy here. This is all stuff right off the top of my head. No, I mean I think she'll still be around. I think she's under contract anyway to to stick around, but. Uh, but no, it, it would just it would be shocking if they did something like that. Totally shocking. Well, uh, and here's the thing: I don't like people doing stuff just because it's going to be shocking. Because I've had enough of that in real life. I don't need that in my television too. <laughs> Sometimes it would just be nice to oh gosh have a main character live. Well, I mean, look, I'd appreciate that. Look what they did with the death of Culber, right? I mean, they they really went for shock value on that one, and then you know kept hitting us with it in every previously on the show. You know, oh by the way, did you know we killed Culber in a really bad way? Check it out. You know, <laughs> they they did not tire ever of showing us that, which you know was a s stressful thing for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it, it seems obvious to me that Michael is going to get in the suit because when Spock mind meld with the Red Angel and with what they found in Arium and they found the bio neural signatures that they said is Michael Burnham. There's no way you could fake these. These are, this is 100% accurate, but yet we find out that's not Burnham, Michael Burnham in the suit. So she obviously has to get in the suit at some point. And some of these red angels we've seen in the show are Michael and maybe others at different times are her mother. That's my it's, assumption. That is quite possible because wibbly wobbly timey wimey. Right. Yep. Hand wavy stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that every time it deals with Michael almost dying, like when she was a child and in some of these episodes, it might be her mom coming to save her. And the other times where it doesn't involve her death, it's Michael herself. That is quite possibly true. Especially when it comes to Spock. Yeah. And this actually brings something else to my mind. Um, I'm going to change gears a little bit, if that's okay with you guys. Yes, please. Um, so... So that whole scene with Michael suffocating really seriously triggered me <laughs> so bad, guys. I had nightmares. Did you really have nightmares? <sighs> One of my fears is dying by suffocation. Oh, wow. And I have asthma. 
And so when I can't breathe very well and I'm trying to get my inhaler and, and take care of that, I start to panic. And that actually goes back to about four years ago when I had a really bad case of pneumonia. It was so bad and I didn't know it was pneumonia as early as I should have, which is why I switched doctors after that. But I couldn't even lay down. I couldn't even recline or I couldn't breathe. And have you ever tried to sleep sitting up for three weeks? It's not good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There is no sleep. And just walking for a few steps would make me so out of breath that I couldn't speak. And I would start to feel so panicked every time because my my fast-acting inhaler was not helping. And when I finally was diagnosed and treated properly, then everything got better almost immediately, like within 24 hours. I was breathing so much better. Within three days, I was able to lay down to sleep again. But watching her suffocate just brought all of that back. Mm. And it was, and I thought, after the first time I watched it, I thought, okay, I've gotten through that. It'll be easier the second time. Oh, no, it was worse. It was worse because I knew it was coming. And I paid more attention to it. And I'm like, oh, my Lord, I'm going to have bad dreams. No, they, they they did. Everything in that scene was really well done. I mean, they had effects on her oh face gosh, yes. with, you know, how her face looked. They had the dust, you know, the sounds. And, and then you got the, they'd cut to the people who were watching it. I mean, it, it was it was really well done. You know, there was nothing. There was not one little beat that was done incorrectly in that whole sequence. It was It was really, really well done and just terrifying. So I, I totally agree with you, you know, and if anybody out there that had any kind of issues with breathing, I think could totally identify with how uh, traumatic it was. I think Sonequa yeah. Martin green may be the one of the best actors we've had in a star Trek series. Agree. Agree wholeheartedly because she, her facial expressions alone put her over the top for me, but she, it, she's the total package, in my opinion. Just everything she does is magic to me. Yeah. I love every little move she makes. It's just, <laughs> I don't know. It's just, um, I don't, there, she's just, she embodies this character so completely and so fully and puts so much into it. How could I not love it? So, well, you know, she's, no, go ahead, John. No, I was going to agree with you. I think she is amazing. I was a big fan of hers from Walking Dead before, you know, her connection with Star Trek was even mentioned. So I'm a big fan of SMG. I think she's wonderful. And I think she deserves tremendous credit for the acting job that she's doing. But I wanted to run a thesis by you and, and maybe the folks in the chat. Um, and I'm particularly thinking about fans uh, who have been longtime fans of Star Trek from like maybe 10 years plus. And because I'm in that group. And one of the things I'm very aware of in myself is that when I'm watching Discovery, I have like these two thoughts in my head, which is like, oh my God, new Star Trek. 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 Right. And like, I have this sort of, you know, this, this 10 year old sort of like new Star Trek, new Star Trek, new Star Trek, you know, going on. And at the other time I'm like, well, is this really good? I mean, do I like it? You know? And, I'm, and so one half of me is trying to evaluate it. And the other half of me is like jumping up and down, squeeing like a tweener girl at a Bieber concert and I and I and I have a hard time trying to reconcile these two things so I don't feel like I can even be objective in a lot of ways because one of the things I noticed about season one is that I look back at some of the things I said in season one and then my opinion sort of cooled uh, on some of the things in season one and I think huh you know was it because I was just so jazzed because it's new Star Trek or you know is it am I in five years going to look back on it and go nope I was right on. You know, I, I don't know. I'm not, and this is not a criticism of the show. This is more about my feelings. I don't know if I'm alone in this or if other people have had this, but I'd be curious to see what you guys think. You are not alone. I was even just thinking about that today about myself, and I've thought about that at other times because I watch these episodes, and especially this season, I leave every episode thinking like, oh, I love this show. The show is so on top of things. And then I get online, which is a big mistake, and then I hear some criticisms and I'm like, well, yeah, I can see that. And, you know, I'm also, I've also come to find out that I'm more a, of a forgiving type person. Like I always look for the good in things. And then there's people who always look for the bad in things. And I'm not trying to be critical when I watch it, but I understand some of the criticism, but I don't see it a lot of times. Like, you know, like I'll hear people say like, Today, I just heard someone say, oh, this episode was clunky. 
I've watched it again and I never left it feeling like it was clunky. I don't know where they got that from. And I like, is it because like you're saying, John, I'm just so into this because I've been a big Star Trek fan. I'm so excited about it that I'm just not seeing it and I can't be objective or not. I have never claimed to be objective about this show because it's impossible to be objective about a creative work. We are all going to interpret things differently depending on our life experience, our li- our loves, our hates, all of those things. It's impossible. This is a this is a creative effort. It is not a textbook. You cannot be objective about this. 100%. And I don't ever even bother trying. I know what I like. I know what I don't like. And so the criticisms don't always bother me. In fact, they rarely bother me because I just don't see things the same way. And nobody sees everything the same way as another person. We are all individuals. And so how can we be objective about something like this upon which there are so many levels of interpretation? I think that's fair, Brandy. I think it's very fair. Yeah, I think that's perfect. I will be thinking that all the time now. (laughs) (laughs) I'm happy to help. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, and I do agree. I mean, even when people are like, oh, I don't like Star Trek, or of course I like Star Wars also. Oh, I don't like Star Wars. That's fine. I don't expect everybody to like the same things that I do. But I I can't tell when something is really bad. Okay, even if I love yeah. it, I know if it's really bad. Well, you know, we've we've seen Star Trek episodes or movies that we go, yeah, I I love Star Trek, but that really wasn't very good. But that's not the case for the most part in this series so far. No, I think I think yeah, you're right, Brandy. And you know, wh- one of the things I, I think that I identify with when I watch these episodes is, you know, I, like I said, I was a veteran, right? And I was actually in the Navy on a submarine. And I, while policies and procedures will change, there's a certain set of rules about how ships work, you know, and how things have to work on a ship to make the thing go. And when I watch a Star Trek episode and I see something, I'm like, no. No, I don't I don't think that would work. And I'm not talking about like how much vacation somebody has, or I'm just talking about, you know, how they do maintenance or some little technical thing that I'm like, yeah, that's not how that would actually work, I think. You know, that's the kind of stuff that takes me out of the episode and I totally get that other people would be like, What? That, that I didn't even notice that, you know, because we're all the sum of our experiences. So I think you bring up a, a good point. I'm gonna reassess now based on what you said. Well, I appreciate that, but there is one thing I cannot forgive in movies or television, and that is people using asthma inhalers wrong. You know, just (laughs) ask anyone who's ever had asthma. You don't go, that's not how it works. You inhale. Yeah, but we don't have time as I to sit there and wait for that. Yeah, but see, that's that's one of those things where I'm like, you're you're not even keeping it in your lungs long enough for it to work. So you, you know, a show that was really good at this was the 2003 Battlestar, and yes. I, I was listening to one of the commentaries, and uh, James Callis, who I just am totally in awe of as an actor, right? Oh, he's, he's amazing. amazing. And in oh. one of the podcasts where he was actually a guest. Uh, he was talking about this thing called the tragedy of verisimilitude, which is a horrible name, but it's, he was talking about how in an, in a movie that he was on, I don't think it was Battlestar or something else. They required, um, a scene where they were, where a bunch of rescuers were going to come across a guy who had frozen to death. That was the scene. And they were going to be like, Oh, who was this? Oh, here's the guy we were looking for. And you know, and all that. And in the, I can't remember the exact details, like in the script, the, the body was supposed to be naked. And they're like, well, why would this guy freezing to death be naked? And it's because in reality, when people are freezing to death, one of the last thing that happens before they die is they take off their clothes because they feel all this warmth because their body is dying and they feel hot and take off their clothes. But in a show, you then have to have some idiot character be like, why is he naked? And then somebody else says, well, you see, Timmy, when somebody dies of, you know, uh, hypothermia, they often feel warmth because of all the blood being released from the core. And you're wasting minutes of a show to explain (laughs) this real thing that no one actually cares about and you're not driving the plot forward, you know? So I'm always conflicted about this stuff, but I I just recently heard this somewhere. Was it on your show, John? It it might have been. I don't know. (laughs) I just heard this recent, the thing you just said, I heard somewhere recently. But James Callis came up with that. So there you go. So he's the source. I give all credit to him. I love it. I love it. It, Just when I thought I couldn't love him more. All I know is I'm freezing right now. I'm going to take this shirt off. (laughs) 
Oh, dude, no, please. Do not <laughs> shock the audience shirt. with that. Oh, sorry. I'm out of uniform. I got my 2009 science outfit on here. I love that. So, yeah, I wear this around town. You know, typically when I go to the grocery store, you know, I got to be styling, spreading the living long and prospering at the, you know, at the Safeway. Seriously, do I you? Do. Have you ever done that? Or do you really do that? Uh, I totally have, man. Yeah. Okay. It, cool. did, 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 you, did you see the, uh, the recent Star Trek uh, Let's Make a Deal episode? No, I haven't seen that yet. Dude, I was, was in it, on it. it. Oh, really? I was in it. I was called. I was up there with Wayne Brady. Oh my gosh! Did that w- did that air this week? No, Dude. it was uh, two months ago as we recorded. Oh, I was gonna say that was like two months ago. Well, I remember they taped it like <laughs> in September like months ago. In yeah. September, yeah. And no, I was and, in, I, and I was, was dressed as a follower of Lokai uh, from TOS with the half black, half white. Oh, oh yeah, man! I'll have to look. For I will that totally somehow. wear a costume anywhere, man. I'm, you know what? When I was young, I was be like, "Oh, I, I'm a nerd. I don't want to be beat up." Now I'm like, "I'm a nerd." <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm out and proud. You know, I, I think we all got to be that way. Yeah. Well, you know, I would have rather be beaten up for a Star Trek uniform than have been forced to wear dresses to school every day. So, you know, <laughs> we pick our battles. Same here. My mom was always <laughs> putting me in dresses. I'm like, so rude. Oh. So rude. I'm like, hey, where's my maybe. Stance? Maybe, though, we can find that episode of Let's Make a Deal on CBS All Access. It's well, on that's there. That's where I was going to look. Is it? It, it, it it's is. still on there? It absolutely is, yeah. All, all of CBS, it's all on there. Yep. Yay! Guess what I'm going to do Ta-da! tomorrow morning? <laughs> 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 hey, okay, let's jump back to Discovery here. Yes, let's talk uh, about the show. Let's make a Discovery now. Uh, so Ash Tyler. Yes. I wanted to talk about that real quick. What'd you think? I'm not, you know, I loved Ash Tyler. He was one of my favorite characters in season one. And I'm not by like this season. He's not doing anything for me. Even the relationship with Burnham. I'm just kind of, mm, I need something more from him. He needs his own story, like an episode. Yeah. I, I can kind of see your point. I'm just happy for anything that I get, but I think that, for oh, he doesn't know what he he's still in that he's kind of in the same place as Culber, but Culber's figuring it out a little bit better because he actually went to counseling. And um, yeah, that's that's that was a lovely scene, by the way. Culber talking to the admiral and as yes, a counselor, loved it, and yes. not as an admiral, loved it. absolutely adored that because I have been through counseling in my life, and I am a huge advocate for taking care of your mental health. And asking for help when you need it, because that actually does not make you weak. That makes you stronger. That if you're strong enough to admit that you need help, that makes you actually a really strong person. Are you hearing me, Michael Burnham? Anyway, <laughs> can I just say something? And I mean, this is this is very personal, <laughs> but um, I have never been to counseling, but I just made an appointment today for next week. Oh, good for because you, Bruce. I'm trying to deal with something. So that it was good to hear that actually. So thank you. No, it's it's honestly the worst period of my life. If I had not gone to counseling, I probably wouldn't be here today. I probably at some point would have taken my own life. So get help, people. Yes. It's there's nothing to be ashamed of. That's right. You would get help if you had a physical ailment. Get help for mental ailments. It. It, there's nothing to be ashamed of and we need to erase that stigma that there is something that is just incurable about you if you have a mental problem no that is not how the body works that's not how this works so i am so so grateful for them putting that scene in this show i had a point and i've already forgotten no i know what it is okay so ash is still trying to figure out who he is now because he doesn't have his, you know, he's not on the Klingon homeworld anymore. He's not there to help Lorel. And he can't be in Starfleet, really. But, you know, he's in... He, basically, he had nowhere else to go. And he just so desperately wants to just do something right. I feel like that's his main drive right now, is he just wants to do something good, something that will benefit people, instead of, yeah. you know, to maybe to just... For his own self-worth i think but he just hasn't figured himself out yet so and maybe the writers haven't figured him out yet i'm not sure so, and maybe they're saving that for a little later when we do see Lorel and the klingon there, there's a classic and, scene i think that's going to come up at some point i just want to lay a marker on this uh which is that if you've ever seen the classic richard gear film an officer and a gentleman uh he he joins the the 
uh, Navy, and he he goes to like basically officer boot camp, and and Louis Gossett Jr. is the guy who's trying to get him through, and they end up in this big fight at the climax of the film, and Louis Gossett Jr. is Jr. is like, why don't you leave? Just quit, just quit, just quit, you know, and that just quit and it's this moment of high drama and richard geary looks up at the character looks up at him and he says because i don't have any place else to go you know and it's one of the most dramatic moments when the guy realizes like this is all i've got in life if i don't complete this like i'm i'm nothing i i yeah. this is literally the last thing i can ever do in my life is this and while while that may or may not be true he believes it to be true and i think that we're going to get a scene like that with ash tyler at some point where he's going to be at the end of his rope and he's going to be like, if I don't do this thing or, you know, whatever the thing is, I, I, I'm I'm over because, you know, he was Vogue and now he's Tyler with, you know, a little bit of Vogue sauce sprinkled on top. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. That came out very differently than I'd intended. All right. <laughs> you can't take it back. Right. It's live. No, no backsies. No backsies. It's all good. It's all good. It's now, now you know why my podcast is edited seven ways to Sunday. But um, I, I think we're going to come to that scene where he's just like, you know, th- this is it. This is all I've got. And if I don't make this thing work that I've subscribed myself to, you know, I'm I'm just I'm nothing and I'm over. And I think there's going to be a moment of high drama and I'm looking forward to it because I think that um, Shazad is certainly up to the, the acting challenge of it. And I think it's going to be a high, high drama moment. So I'm on board. I think that's one thing I really am noticing and enjoying about this series is it's not so much about the relationships with each other's with each other. It's more about them individually on their own self discovery. I feel like there's so much of that going on where people really are trying to figure themselves out. And it takes this journey and this relationship with family, as mentioned earlier in that episode, and exploring the stars and the future and the technology and the science and all this exploring, it all comes down to just the self-discovery of oneself. And that's really where the adventure is. Yeah, well, I I personally think that you never stop discovering things about yourself because we are not static beings. We are growing and evolving every second of every day. And, you know, I'm not the same person that I was, you know, a year ago. I'm not the same person that I was 10 years ago. And I'm constantly learning new things about myself. I mean, there are certain things that stay the same. I cry at everything, right? Mm -hmm. And my laugh is obnoxious and, you know, things like that. Those are things that I know about myself that are fixed. But there are other things that I've discovered that you know, on my journey of discovery that I never realized were a part of me until I started examining, oh, wait, I, I'm i actually interested in this thing now. Okay, let's explore this. So so you're saying that I luminous think, beings are we, not this crude matter. Yes. 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 Excellent. Totally approve. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've hit yeah, that hour to... mark, though. So <laughs> My goal is start... to make y'all regret totally getting me on this show. I feel like I've succeeded. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> nice try, though. You've got to bring you got to bring a lot more trouble if you think you're gonna make it. I, I made a so, start you know. uh, fifteen minutes late. No, you no, did that not. That was Brandy. <laughs> that was all on my side. So. <laughs> That was all on my side, guys. Yeah, she's the one we can blame for that one. <laughs> yep, I will take it. I will be your lightning rod of hate. Bring no. it on. Uh, it's all love and joy up in here, yo, because that's how we roll. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's how we roll. <laughs> <laughs> so um, are there any like final thoughts or anything we haven't discussed uh, that you want to definitely bring up? Okay, for example, this is real quick. Uh, Lieutenant Nielsen. Nielsen, she... Uh, mm-hmm. walks on the bridge it's the original actress who played arium in season one and now she's manning that post that she did when she was arium but now she's not arium <laughs> that's the uh yeah. spore drive operator on the on the bridge that's yes. the, yeah and that's uh sarah midich who by the way is a delightful yes. person i got a picture with her at stlv last year yeah i spent some time talking to her she was really nice very nice I, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting her, but it was it was one of those entering, interesting moments where 
we as fans are enjoying seeing her walk on, but the bridge crew have a completely different reaction because now it's really cemented that Arium is gone. Yes. Yes. And either that and, they're like, wasn't isn't that the original Arium? Yeah, I mean that's that's and I actually I felt because I knew that that was her obviously, uh, and I didn't actually expect to see that scene, and so when it happens, I'm just like, oh, gut punch, oh wow, just and especially Detmer's reaction, and I'm just like, I was feeling I was feeling everything the bridge crew was feeling, even though I'm just and after the scene was over, I'm like, I turned to Dave and I'm like, you know that was the old Arium, right? <laughs> 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 so anyway yeah. yeah but yeah that actually i felt that gut punch and it was really well done so again bravo yes Discovery. bravo i've also seen in the chat that uh it was mentioned stamet and colber are gay and it's the first time that word has been used in star trek the word gay is actually that is true. first time we've ever heard that word so mm-hmm kudos to that also the, i like the part what, yeah were you gonna say something I, to the that, only thing or? i was gonna say is i just couldn't figure out what um mirror georgia was up to in that whole scene where she's like it was kind of weird she's poking stamets she's poking tilly she's poking culber and i'm like why what is she trying to do here like what is you know i, I don't mean to get all hollywood but like what is her motivation you know like what is she actually trying to do <laughs> I, I i literally have no idea so i think she's trying to get them in her own way to work things out and notice that they want to be with each other by kind of stirring the pot it's like what tilly said at the end what just happened <laughs> yeah um i looked at it as uh basically it, for lack of a better word and oh that's a good word for it um some people in uh, in fact my husband <laughs> just said uh, she was matchmaking yes absolutely. in a very why would she care reverse psychology way what exactly why she, does she care she likes babies too Right. This is what I'm saying about the character. Like, I'm trying to figure her out. <laughs> yeah, we haven't. We just don't know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm yeah. at a loss. You know, I'm curious to see where it goes. It's like I said, I, I don't so. think we can actually judge a lot of Discovery based on just an episode. I think we have to see the whole table set, you know, before we can determine whether or not it was a satisfactory meal. Mm hmm. Like I don't know. I'm 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 actually enjoying gobbling my way through the main course right now. So, <laughs> just to be fair. Oh yeah. Oh oh, and the word pansexual was the first time too. Thank you, Christopher Littlefield. That too. Yes. Um. One other thing I wanted. To, I I love Spock holding the phaser at the other crewmen trying like let yep. Michael die. Michael must die. I just like, yes. <laughs> Seems so Spock where it's like, what are you doing? But yet he gets it more than anybody else. Absolutely. And I think they had kind of a quiet understanding without even saying anything that yes. this is what had to happen. Yes. I uh, totally want to see the conversation between Pike and Spock after that. I wondered about yeah. that too. Yeah. Because he, he did disobey a direct order, but he was on medical leave. So, hmm. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Spock could say to Pike, I wasn't in the right frame of mind. See, this is one of these <laughs> things where it's like medical leave, no medical leave. You know, a commanding officer, especially a ship captain, gives you an order. I don't care who you are. You know, that's one of those things I was talking about before. It brings me right out of the show. You know, if they were, to, oh, yeah. well, he was on medical leave. Therefore, the order was invalid. Uh, that's like going to make me like rage, you know, rage. <laughs> Okay, yeah. another that reminds me, by the way, there I don't know what happened to the other doctors because we keep going to Culber in this episode and Oh, Dr. Pollard. Yeah, where's Pollard? They, hanging they with saying, the, well, we're neat Culber. He's hanging with the chief engineer and number one eating spicy hamburgers out in the uh the mess deck. <laughs> yeah, where's number one? I want more number one before the season ends, except a hamburger scene. <laughs> What the heck? And then I, I don't think anybody else works in engineering because, you know, we still haven't met the chief engineer and they keep going to Stamets all the time. So, whatever. well, to be fair, we haven't actually seen main engineering either. Right. True. So what, what? Nothing's going on there. It's like That's even a- in this situation, it's like it doesn't have anything to do with the spore drive. And they're like, all right, well, we should get with Stamets or we need Stamets on that. It's like what? Why is Stamets the go-to person for everything when it comes to engineering? Him and Tilly. 
I mean, I know it's a show and you got actor, whatever, you know, I'm just saying it's like, I'm just, well, what I, had I, that problem what I said, with all the Star Trek series, by the way, <laughs> well, this is, this is what I said to Dave earlier. Cause we were talking about this and I said, well, when you think about chief officers, like chief engineer, chief medical officer, et cetera, in real life, those people are not actually as hands on as they are in Star Trek. That's true. They I'll actually are in more of an administrative position where they're delegating stuff. And yes, maybe they do enjoy taking, you know, a full shift in engineering or the, or sick bay or whatever from time to time. But honestly, we saw that so often in Star Trek that it's actually a very unrealistic. It's far more realistic to maybe see them from time to time, but we haven't been introduced to them at all because why do we care about middle management? <laughs> we don't. It, it, well, no, I, that's I, a true I, thing. Exactly. I mean, that's, I've always had that problem with Star Trek where it's like, okay, every mission, why is it always the senior crew? There's like hundreds of people on the ship. And it's like every mission, it's always these like four or five same people all the time. And it's like, couldn't you send somebody else down to deal with that? You know, I mean, like, anyway, as, yeah. as, it's just how TV as, works. As someone who was actually on a ship, if you ever saw an officer with a tool in his hand, y'all better run. Like, mm. run as far away as possible, because that is literally like giving toddlers loaded guns. Do not do that. It is a bad idea. <laughs> so, S- Discovery has fixed Star Trek. That's what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> All right. I, w- I want to ask the chat real quick uh, to rate this episode so we can uh, see what everybody thinks of it. I'm, I'm still not really sure where this lands for a lot of people yet. So I did go online and read some comments, but I didn't read that many. So I'm very curious to find out. So, uh, John, your final thoughts and ratings, and you make up your own rating in whatever scale you want and just have fun with that. Oh, no, I, I have my own scale because I've been doing this Voyager watch through because I've missed a lot of Voyager when it was originally on. So I rate, yeah, yeah I rate everything out of five beardy Spocks. So um, I would give uh, this episode, I think, you know, two and a half, two and a half is the, is the median score, which means a solid episode. So I, I would give this one, certainly, I think three and a half out of five Beardy Spocks for sure. Um, and that could change based on what happens at the end of the season. Because like I said, I think once you see the whole season, a lot of opinions about things in the middle could change. So that's, that's where it stands today. So to talk to me in the, at the beginning of season three, and maybe I'll give you a different score, but that's where I am today. Excellent point. Yeah. You have to wait till this all plays out to see how it really fits in. Brandy, what are your thoughts? Um, well, the, despite my difficulties with parts of this episode that did not in any way lessen my enjoyment, but just triggered certain past traumas. Uh, I really, I enjoyed this episode. There was just so much, oh, so much fantastic performance from everybody. It's just, mm, there was everybody just bring in their a game. So for me, it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, <laughs> I didn't think of a really silly scale. I I'm going to rate it six out of five puffs off of my inhaler. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I used we to, don't have time for six puffs. I, I used to just rate everything out of Spocks, and then before the season started, all the uh, you know a lot of just negative people just came. Oh, Spock doesn't have a beard. Beard Spock. Beard. I was like, all right, now I'm using bearded Spocks, beardy Spocks for everything. So <laughs> excellent. I like beardy Spock. Mm. There you go. Oh, gosh, I do. Uh, I'm not just for his appearance. Come on. Oh, okay. <laughs> But well, no, I, I like I like a nice beard, and and he can grow a good beard. Well, uh, there's obviously something else about him that we'll we'll touch on here in a minute in the chat because I've seen it been brought up throughout the whole show, and now the rating by this one thing. But real quick, I would give this. I, I'm kind of I think the three and a half out of five works for me too for this episode. There was a lot of things I like about this. Um, and then some other things I'm just like, yeah, like, okay, the suit is futuristic, but then they can make it. And I don't know. There was just a lot of little things like that that I was just not really sure about. But yeah, we have to see how the whole thing plays out. But yeah, I'll go with like three and a half out of five time crystals. And the other thing I don't really care for, even though I went to the Wikipedia page real quick and I saw time crystals are a real thing. So that maybe I'll give it 3.6 now 
out of five time crystals. By, by the way, Bruce, the, the chat room is in demand, is demanding, like in the strongest possible way that you make reference to Spock's buttocks. See, that's the thing I kept seeing in the chat. What is up with with spots? Spots. Spocks. <laughs> Spock's butt. What is up with What that? is up with those spockly vulcanized buttocks? I don't know. Did we see some Spock butt in this episode? I have like, no idea. Okay, when okay, I'll explain to you because I did notice it. I'm not dead. <laughs> but after Spock, you know, secures uh, B- Michael in the chair, and he goes back into, you know, whatever their command central, whatever that room was, yeah. as he, he turns around and we see him walking in that door and we get a really nice shot of his posterior and everything back there was very tight. So, and there, there's actually been, um, a photo shoot that CBS did with, uh, with Ethan Peck. And there is one shot where he is in a, a tank top. And the man is built, guys. He is, he is built. So yeah, he's got, he's got some nice, uh, he's got some nice firmness, uh, going on <laughs> in his, um, muscular region. So you like the firmness and the beard? I do. I do. I can't say it's not attractive because I find it very attractive. Was it a close is- up on his butt? No, it wasn't a close okay. up, but you did get a really good look at it. Oh, okay. Well. I'll have to do that on my rewatch. <laughs> All right. I will have to appreciate that the next time around. But uh, you, yeah. will, you will not be able to unsee it. After I'll, I'll have to see how that plays out as the season progresses and how yeah. that all fits in when the season's done. How does that butt fit in? No, so, okay. yeah. I, I need to do some research on it because for uh, STLV, I'm going to cosplay as Justin Timberlake. I'm going to be bringing sexy back. So I need to do some field research. <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't want you to go in the safe way as Spock's butt. <laughs> Please don't do that. (laughs) (laughs) You never know what you're going to see in the coffee aisle. That's all I'm saying. You're in there trying to pick up your cake cups and, you know, maybe a nice piece of chicken. And all of a sudden, bam, it's in full effect. Living long and prospering. (laughs) Prospering. (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh okay we gotta wrap this up so let's look we have some <laughs> scores in here oh uh, we're gonna hit the butt thing again okay <laughs> i see uh a, a seven question mark and a six question mark from <laughs> alexandra i guess you're trying to figure that out uh so 3.5 undead moms out of five six out of seven red angel appearances 12 out of 10 re- red angel suits wow that's really great seven out of ten insert whatever thing here spock's <laughs> butt is the real red angel <laughs> automated joy i see you <laughs> i see a 10 I out could of go 10. some places with that and i'm not gonna <laughs> 10 out of 10 and a one out of 10 spock butts 9.5 out of 10 3.75 out of 5 eye pokes uh four out of five flirting former emperors <laughs> eight out of ten uh eight out of ten people are questioning the one spock butt four out of five two spock butt cheeks okay that's enough <laughs> i think that's about all the ratings i think we get it so yeah it's still fairly high there you go okay very good anything else or should we just close the shop and get ready for next week's episode I think we've done enough damage for today. I think we have. So, John, when you're not sitting there in your room on your butt, where can people find you online? You can find me pretty much at uh, Trek Profiles uh, everywhere. I'm most active on Twitter at Trek Profiles, but I also have Facebook at Trek Profiles and, of course, TrekProfiles.com, where you can find links to my podcast where I interview Star Trek fans about their fandom and why they love Star Trek so much. Uh, And uh, I've been uh, very fortunate to have some great guests on uh, sharing their stories. And it's been uh, it's been just a a real blast and a a real um, honor for me to talk to these folks and to talk track with them. So that's where you can find me. Well, let me ask you real quick. Have you heard of the show My Star Wars Story? I have Have not heard that. I have not. Oh, interesting. Okay, I just wondered because that's a show that's very similar. It's a show where. Uh, Scott Rifen is the host and he interviews Star Wars fans and it's all about their Star Wars story. So I just wondered if you no, guys knew it, each other. A- actually, no, I'll tell, I'll give you the, the very brief um, reason how I came to it, which is that um, 
on Tricorder, uh, my friends uh, that ran Tricorder n- knew me because I was a supporter of the network and and was you know uh, t- interacting with them on social media, and they know that I live here in Vegas. And they were doing a, a series of podcasts that were about Star Trek Las Vegas, and they wanted to do like a 101 series for, you know, what should people know about the city? What if they want to go to the grocery store? What if they want to- Oh, the you know, Shore Leave podcast. Yeah, right? the Shore Leave podcast, yeah. which is part of Tricorder. Yeah. And and they were they asked me to be on the show because they know I live here. And I said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And uh, Heather said to me right at the beginning, she's like, you know, you, you should do a podcast for us. And I was like, yeah, no. And the reason is because there's so many great, Star Trek podcasts out there that I, everything's being done, right? I mean, you want episode analysis, you want, you know, hangouts. I mean, there, there's so, so much great content out there. I mean, Trek FM does an incredible, amazing work. You know, there's, there's the, but the Trek geeks, there's, there's uh, synthaholics. I mean, there's so many great shows out there and I just thought I couldn't do anything new. And, um, I was actually listening to a podcast that has nothing to do with Star Trek. It was a tech podcast. And the host was saying, well, my show isn't about the tech. It's about this community of people that we've built. And I thought, oh, my God, that's the show, right? I'm going to make a show not about Star Trek. I want to do a podcast about Star Trek fans, not for fans, but about fans. And that's when the whole thing came to me. Like, literally, it was one of those bolt of lightning moments. And I wrote up a thing, sent it off to Tricorder, and that document that pitch that's still the show i i haven't changed the format at all it's this exact thing i came up with um right then and there and it's just been it's just been great so if people have an interest in that go check it out on trek profiles you can start anywhere because it's an interview show and it's not sequential so um give it a listen if you like awesome well thank you for joining us it's and, and it's a great show and uh, by the way heather has been on live from the edge when we did an episode on season one. So she was on that too. Um, so Brandy, uh, tell people where they can find you and then we'll go to our closing thing and we need the chat. I've seen some suggestions on what voice to do, but uh, I would like to see if there's more suggestions that come through. Yeah, you got to get them out now, people. So uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brandywine 12 or my alter ego, dark Amy knows rockets. <laughs> <laughs> it it happened on a live show um so uh you can also find me uh, uh trolling not trolling i'm sorry trolling trolling <laughs> trolling oh, that was you trolling in the babel conference i'm trolling for posts not trolling trolling <laughs> look it up it's a word um and uh, you can hear me on this show you can also hear me on the dark corner podcast with some guy named dave jacola now he's my other better half, my sweetheart, my partner in crime, and we do a podcast where we talk about whatever we want, usually nerdy stuff, uh, from a bit of a darker point of view. And uh, there's another secret project that isn't fully announced yet, so you'll have to wait till next week on that. I know where people can find out next week. I know. Yeah, you can find out by listening to Everyone Got Your Glasses Ready, the next episode of Literary Tracks. Nice. Right. Hey, we got through this episode without mentioning it until the end. That's right. pretty awesome. Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. And of course, on Literary Treks with Dan Gunther here on the Trek FM network about Star Trek books and comics. And you can find me on the Star Wars report, of course, talking Star Wars. And we'll be at Star Wars Celebration in Chicago in just a couple of weeks. So if you're going to be there, let me know. And I'd love to meet you because I love meeting fans. That's what Celebration is all about. It's about the community and meeting one another. And, uh, so anyway, I guess that's it. Brandy, so we have some suggestions on how to read our closing here. One is, and I don't recommend this one, the voice of Spock's butt. No, thank you. We won't do the, that. The voice of suffocating Burnham. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the voice of suffocating Burnham. That's, that one I think would do good. Or there's one, the closing as uh, Cornwell doing a therapy session. Uh Linus, we've had that request before. And okay, here's here's the thing, guys. If it's going to require a digital alteration of the voice, I cannot do it. Right. right. <laughs> I cannot. I, like, I kind of like this one here. Georgia's flirting voice. No. <laughs> I'm not even touching that one. 
So any of those uh, interest you or do you have one on your own? Uh, mm, it's it's kind of a toin a toin toss. Oh wow, a coin toss between uh, suffocating Burnham and th- actually probably that wouldn't be a good idea <laughs> because you won't be able to uh, understand anything I'm saying. Yeah, that might be a little tough. <laughs> so I'm going to try Admiral Cornwell doing a therapy session. Okay, here we so. go. Admiral Cornwell doing a <clears throat> therapy session. Be sure to check out our Discovery coverage throughout the week. Live from the Edge, airs on Fridays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Our commentary will be available as tracks from the Edge. We'll discuss your feedback on postcards from the Edge. You can catch the full analysis on the Edge main show. And join us for notes from the Edge with our own Chris Jones for links between Discovery and the broader franchise. I think if you really explore your feelings that you'll find all of these in the main feed for the edge and in the Trek FM master feed. Now going forward, we need to focus on hearing your thoughts on discovery. And the best place to do that is going to be the Babel conference, which is our listeners group on Facebook. And there Amy Nelson is going to collect your feedback for postcards from the edge. You can also find us on Twitter at Trek FM or send us email using the contact form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and choose the edge. Now I'm going to get a little personal here and thank some of them, our associate producers, actually all of them. We're just going to thank all of them right now. They're Norman C. Lau, Tony Robinson, Thomas Paleo, Lisa Slack, Shoab Mirza, Richard Rutledge, James Muldrow, Cornelia Reutner, Ryan Maylett, Chris Trebuzio, and Brian Malosh. Now, in closing, uh, I would like to see you all again here next week. And if you'd like to help us keep all of our shows going and even become an associate producer, you can visit patreon.com slash check FM for those details. Yay. Thank you, Admiral, for that session. <laughs> I hope it was okay. <laughs> well, I was pretty impressed. <laughs> okay, thanks. It is. Very I never soothing. know how. I never know how it's going. I never know how it's going because I'm reading a thing, and I'm not looking at the chat or anything. Well, one of the things the chat said after you started the suggestion came in about singing like Saru. I thought that would be. <laughs> It, it, it sounded like a mix between Admiral Cornwell and a little bit of Bob Ross, you know, happy space squirrels. <laughs> it was. Yes. That was very Bob Ross. In there. I love it. There are no accidents in Star Trek. Just, you know, happy accidents. <laughs> yep. No mistakes. Just no, happy accidents. Just little stars with eyes and a little smiley. And there's a little They're Klingon little living eyes. there and he's got a friend. <laughs> let's give him a little friend let's give him let's give him a targ let's give him a little targ right here oh my yes. god i totally want that show now oh. <laughs> well CBS Bob Ross going on copla my friends i can picture i bet i bet if you look online you can find a picture of bob ross as a klingon i bet somebody's already done that if not they will i'm googling now. klingon bob they, ross they as now. we speak so, uh, real quick, uh, one piece of business I want to mention real quick. If uh, you're listening to this live or if you're listening to this the next day as a podcast, uh, if you're a patron on Patreon with Trek FM, I am hosting the monthly chat or conversation, whatever we call it, the roundtable. And it's at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. And it's about Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. That's what we're talking about tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so, hey join us it'll be a lot of fun with that said john thank you again for joining us chat thank you for joining us and brandy as always it's been a pleasure and how do we end this live long and prosper and keep calm and disco on 